Welcome back to Brooks and Beckles. It's the podcast that's uh, getting out to the world and uh, hopefully teaching uh, you young men and ladies uh, how to deal with life. Now, this is an extra special episode. Uh, It's been an honor to do this podcast with the young Derek Brooks, who's not that darn young anymore. And you can see by the gray hair. And this is an extra special honor because... Like I hold, I hold both these two young men in a, a very high esteem. I talk about them all the time, whether they know it or not. Obviously, Derek Brooks and this young man here, Coach Dungey. How are you, brother? I'm doing well. Yeah, great to be with you. Yeah. Well, first of all, Coach, uh, every when I when I did the first podcast with Derek, I said to him, "How you doing, mind, body, soul?" Because a lot of our brothers are struggling. Okay, yeah. you were a coach, but you were also our brother. We played you as well. Mm-hmm. How how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well, uh, personally, and uh, doing great. Appreciate you asking, but uh, you're so right. Um, we have to really look at that. I had a young man uh, who played on our Super Bowl team, uh, mm-hmm. Matt Ulrich, 41 years old, uh, passed away last yes. week. Well, and just, yes. yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. you don't think of that. Uh, we think that everybody's doing great all the time, forever, and um, we are we are frail, frail bodies. Yeah. We, we really are. And, and coach, you know, I talked to Derek about doing this podcast. He said everything, nothing was off limits. And I think you're that guy that talks about everything. You know, mental health is something yeah. that is mm-hmm. talked about throughout our country. It's an epidemic, and I don't know why it's happening. A lot of to do with the, the food, I believe, that we're consuming. There's a lot to do with it. Um, You've dealt with some situations with mental health before in your family. Uh, we, I'm going to tell you firsthand for myself, uh, the passing of your son was one of the yes. toughest things I had to go through on air. I'm not going to compare it yes. to what you went through. I heard mm-hmm. about it live on air a couple minutes before I went on on air, and I was fighting back to tears, sort of like I did with Vincent Jackson. Yeah, I yes. heard that happen yeah. on, live on air as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Talk to the people about mental health, what you've learned about mental health, and how we can combat this today. You know, mental health is very much like physical health. If you came to me and you're playing for me and you said, Coach, my ankle's hurting, we say, we got to get you to a doctor, we got to get you some rehab, we got to get you ready to go get that ankle back 100%. -hmm. Mental health is the same thing, except for a long time, we didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want to discuss it. Someone yes. didn't want to come and say, hey, I, I've, I've got a situation I, I don't know how to handle. Sure. Uh, but it's the same thing. If you don't get it treated, mm-hmm. that ankle is going to continue to hurt you, Correct. and yes. you're not going to be able to function. Uh, the mental health is, is the same way. Uh, I'll tell you, one of the first times I ever had a player talk to me, uh, it was our Super Bowl year, 2006. We traded for a linebacker, Keith O'Neill, uh, mm-hmm. traded for him from Dallas. And he's with us, and we're getting ready to open up the season, go to, to Baltimore. And he came into my office, and he said, Coach, I don't know how to tell you this, but I, I'm, I'm just not comfortable going to the game. My, my wife is new in town and and she doesn't know anybody and i'm, I'm just th- afraid if i leave her and what's going to happen and i'm not feeling this mm-hmm. and it was the first time anybody and i said keith we got to get you comfortable that that's fine yes. and and uh we'll make this happen don't worry about it well i'm, I'm afraid i'm gonna let my teammates down and all that and he went through all of these things but it was the first time anybody had talked to me about feeling yes something mm-hmm. that wasn't physical and it really put a light on in, in my mind. Boy, this is mm-hmm. something we got to look at. Coach, as, as you fast forward that now, how difficult it is, and we just spent a little time with Coach Cooper, and our players now are meeting with the mental coach as part of practice. How do you see the coaches that you talk to today make this a part of their program, very similar to you making family you know, a part of your program when you got here. What are the coaches today telling you how they get in that dynamic? I think they are looking at it and trying to figure out how they can do a better job of formulating all that and making sure they're on top of it. Um, There was a time when we didn't think about that. We didn't consider that. Uh, There was a time we didn't consider family. I I remember when I came here and Mm -hmm. said, hey, this is what we're going to do on Fridays and Saturdays. We're going to have kids around, and it was – like yeah. people were shocked, but mm-hmm. uh, I thought that was really important. And you you get what you emphasize. Yeah. And yeah. if you think it's important and you work on it, mm-hmm. you you will get benefits. Well, how do you think 
the balance now because we're doing this inside as a team, as a coaching staff. But now when the front office is looking at this piece of it too, they're not as in tune yeah. to that dynamic for obvious reasons. Their their contribution is very different than X's and O's and playing, blocking, tackling. We get that. But I, I will argue the point you can't dissect that now in today's world. That has to be a part of it. And we can be very honest here. The part that's a part of it will probably someone end up losing their job. Yeah, you, you have to really believe it's important. And if, if you do, you, you will address it. Uh, I remember when I first got here in 1996 and we started the player program as yes. part of it. And we got Kevin Winston here. Yes. And Kevin Winston was a big part mm -hmm. of our success and what we did. And he helped us tremendously. But you have to get management to buy into that. Mm -hmm. Hey, here's, here's a guy who's going to help us solve some things off the field and a guy who's going to help us in the locker room and is going to help the players develop. Maybe it's not even going to see it now. Yes. It'll be 10 years from now when they're not even here. But it's important. And it, it, that took a little bit of a sales job. Mm -hmm. But then when they see it and they see the results and see how uh, it, it does help the overall program, then it, it gets – instituted a little bit more, and I, I think that was the key. Now, Coach, let's go back to 1996. I remember being in the locker room. I had been in the locker room for six years already, fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, this young man's in the locker room. You walk in the locker room. You have a message, okay? I remember the first speech. I also remember Ray Perkins's first speech and Richard Williamson's first speech and Sam White's first speech, and I liked them all. But your speech stayed consistent. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. I said, I tell people the most consistent man I've ever met in my life is is Tony Dungy, and I've only was with you for one year. That's that's probably one of the biggest regrets of, mm. of my career. But for somebody to come in and have a mentality to change the culture, <laughs> where did you gain that mentality, and how did you know not to waver? Because I watch other coaches. <laughs> waver from the mentality and you look at you and say, wait a minute, you, you still today have not wavered. I really got that in. I was so blessed to play for Chuck Knoll uh, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I came in and they were in the middle of a Super Bowl run. They had won two already. Mm -hmm. I'm a rookie there. And uh, I heard my first speech from him. And I'm thinking he's going to say, here's how we're going to win Super Bowls and keep it going. And if you worked hard in high school and you worked hard in college, you got to be prepared to work twice as hard now because this is hard. I'm ready for all that. And the first thing he said to us was, hey, this is your job. You're getting paid but don't make football your whole life. If you make football your whole life, you're going to be disappointed when this is over. We're going to win, but we're going to win as a group, and we're also going to be part of this community. We have to live here. We don't just play here. We have to live here. And I saw that, and he lived that out. I, I played for two years for him, then I coached on his staff for eight more years, and I watched him win but be very concerned about the community, about people's families, about being role models, all those things. So now, 15 years later, I come down with you guys, and it's my first head job. What am I going to say? What's my message going to be? And it was just that. Hey, guys, we're here to win. That's why they brought me here. But if that's all we do, it, you guys are going to leave the game disappointed. And I don't want you to be disappointed. So we're going <laughs> to win, but we're going to win with the right kind of guys. We're going to do it the right way. And you guys are going to have family life that – will reflect the desire to not just be great on the field, but be great off the field, too. Well, Coach, you know that that speech didn't go well with me. <laughs> <laughs> you came into my office <laughs> shortly after, yes, yes. And you want, you want, let me tell you what he said. He said, Coach, I lost five games in my life before I got here. I lost more games last year than I've lost in my whole life. Tell me about winning. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Well, and I said, we are talking we about winning. We are talking about it. And, you know, Coach explained it because, you know, and, and he told me, he said, I could tell during the speech, I I could look, I look out there and I, I could tell 
this was getting this was getting to you. Mm-hmm. So I expected you to come in here, not just mm-hmm. this soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Coach, he went into a deeper part of the conversation in where he said, Derek, when is it going to be that, but it's going to be in its proper space and place. And he talked about the opportunity of what winning mean when it came to winning at life okay. and how we will use this stage as the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the NFL to serve a greater cause than just what we did at Ray J, well, Ray J Stadium, not Tampa Stadium then. And this was the line that, that Rich, he said, hey, if we focused on that game of life, we'll never lose. Everybody wins. Why? Because only God keeps score. And I said, Coach, I got it. Mm-hmm. I said, say no more, I got it. And the very next phone call I made that evening was to Leroy Selman. Mm-hmm. And I told Leroy, I said, Mr. Selman, this is a conversation I just had with Coach Dungeon. Could you and I go to lunch mm-hmm. this week? He said, sure, come out to USF. And I went out there and, and I just talked to him. I said, this, he said something that is just, I'm not even thinking about you know, the wheel linebacker mm-hmm. position. I was at practice the next day thinking about, man, I saw this in the community, I saw that. I see, mm-hmm. He said, he he got what he wanted to get out of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said, now everything that he talked about then, what you do on the field, it's just gonna all come together. And he really showed, he really showed me the path of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, me and Coach, again, years later, we talked about it. I was like, man, that was so a defining moment for me. Cause it could have went either way. Sure. You know, we know sometimes, man, you go see your head coach, it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it don't all, it, it go either way. But then, man, he struck something. And I think from, from that faith forward, it's probably one of the very, I don't ever think I went in the coach office again. Really? No, my, my mm-hmm. career. I was like, the second time I went in there was an act to go to Africa. Yeah, that's a lot different. <laughs> yeah. 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 Coach, I say that, that was uh, the next time when I asked him and his wife to, uh, Go to uh, South Africa the first time I took mm. kids, you know, on our Brooks Bunch trip, and and Coach was like, "Man, you asking me?" I was like, "Yeah," and he's, I said, "Why?" Here's I said, "Coach, I got some strategy behind this. One, I know we can't start training camp until we get back. Okay, <laughs> I'm all for that." You, I said, <laughs> "Secondly, I want these young men and young women to to see someone that's influencing me mm. every single day, mm-hmm. and why the reason I'm serving this community." Mm-hmm the way I am. I want them to spend time with you and Miss Lauren so they can see firsthand how this is bigger than me making any sure. tackles. But Ian, it was, it was perfect because it really reflected just what I was saying, mm-hmm. that, that this is the, the bigger goal, Correct. the larger purpose that we have. Yeah, we, we want to win. Yeah, we want to bring a Super Bowl here, but we want to do more than that. And sure. that was beautiful. Who, who made you that strong, Coach? Because you know, I like to believe I'm a strong person. Uh, I Once again, I, I look back at your belief, okay? That word belief is very, very strong, okay? As a Christian man, yeah. okay? I'm not an overly religious person, but I have respect for people who do things the right way. Out of everybody I've ever met in my life, you may do it righter than anybody else, okay? This, for me, you live it, but you also ha- came in with a method. This is the way we're going to win. And I'm not wavering. Where did that come from? Because I've seen a lot of wavering in my lifetime. Yeah, well, I, I, the, the first part actually came from my mom. And I can remember as a little kid her telling us over and over and over again her favorite Bible verse, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world if you forfeit your soul? So in her mind, yes, what you achieve is great, but sure. how you do it and why you do it is much more important. So that drove me from a little kid. But then when I got to Pittsburgh again, Coach Noel, he was so resolute in what he believed. This is the way we're going to do it. There's a thousand ways to win, a thousand ways you can do things, but this is our way, and our way is never going to change. There's a stealer way, and that's what I'm looking for. And I saw him, uh, and and I wasn't there when they were 1-13 in 13 his first year, but he did, you know, Joe Green and the older guys said mm-hmm. we knew right then mm-hmm that we were going to be good because our coach did not ever deviate. So that was my plan. I came in and 
we're we're one and eight, <laughs> one and eight, and it doesn't look like it's working. And I'm telling you guys, hey, San Diego, yeah, we're 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 gonna stick with this. We're not changing. This is the plan. We're we're getting better. And I I never forget, we opened up with Green Bay. Mm -hmm. We lost thirty five to three. Okay, I think it's like week eight or week nine. We go up to Green Bay. And we lost 14 to 10 on a block punt. Ooh. We should have won the game. Reggie White. Yeah, Reggie White blocked the punt because we. I didn't do it. No. I didn't do it. Uh, that, that's a whole nother story. But okay. And I said, okay, both of those are losses. All they show on the scoreboard Correct. is L. Yes. But look at the difference from 35 to 3 in a game yes. that we didn't have a chance week one to game 10, 14 mm -hmm. to 10, where we should have won. Yes. Okay, now can we just keep that going? And and you guys saw that it was getting better, yeah, even though the results good. weren't there on the win loss. Mm -hmm. We knew we we're getting better, and then when it finally clicked, then it took off. Oh yeah, it, it clicked with, for me that as we go in that game because we end up knocking Washington out of the playoffs mm -hmm. here. And yeah. man, I forget God. I want I forget his uh, name. It was uh, one of the running backs was saying. You guys are going to be watching us here in a week. Mm. And I'm going back to the heart. I said, Stephen I Davis. Hardy. Yes. Yeah, I said, Hardy. Yeah. I said, I want to do everything I can to make sure he's sitting right next to me <laughs> on the couch yeah, next week. Yeah. And, and we end up knocking him out. But that, to me, going into this, it, like, man, it's there. I think we've – the belief is there. You know, all the – it's like – it's kind of like you're seeing – you want to feel and see the results of what that hard work is. Hey, mm -hmm. you know what? We're going to wear pads on Wednesday. We're going to wear shells on Thursday. And we're going to have a competitive two-minute on Friday. That never changed <laughs> with Coach. With Coach Talk we, about not wavering. Oh, Warren wait. Sapp, <laughs> and, and as only Warren could say it, <laughs> he said – I'm the only person in the world that can tell you what I'll be doing two years from now on this day on Thursday. But if I know you were coaching exactly. today, Coach, or you're coaching today, I have to ask you, if you were coaching today, can you implement the same mentality? Because I, I think – I think they start the season soft. They, we, very soft. You know. And that's why we're actually talking downstairs. That's why I think you're seeing this up and down performances. Correct. You're mm -hmm. seeing – uh, the Bucks go two and zero, and then go into a slump. Mm -hmm. You're seeing San Francisco start right. off look yeah. hot, and yeah. then go into a slump. You're mm -hmm. seeing other teams that don't look good, and they come on because yeah, we. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're ready to play opening day because I no, don't think we worked not. hard enough. No, we're not. You know, it's you know one of the times that I now you know a little humor here that he did have to waiver, okay. and I shared this story a few a uh, few episodes back, University of Tampa. We see these clouds coming in, and, and we we know one coach looking like we're looking at it like man, you know this is coming. It's not Minnesota. No, it's not coach. It's man, <laughs> but coach hey, looking at the strip, looking at it. One hit, we're like man, coach gonna call practice at some point. Coach, nah, hey guys, go. Brad Culpepper mm -hmm. goes up to him. He said, "Hey, coach Dungy, could you come here for a second? Mm -hmm. For those of us that don't know where they're going to go when they leave here, like me, <laughs> can I go in and, put, and you stay? <laughs> only call that, Pepper. Only, yeah, only yeah, and that one got me. I didn't have me. a response. He had a response. You know what? Let's just call it a day. <laughs> Cole Pepper is able to say in. stuff in rooms. I'm like, how do you get away <laughs> with saying stuff like this? No, that's that. crazy. Well, that's, that's a colorful cat. No, no, Coach, you were passed over four times, okay, for a head coaching job. How much do you think that was race related? I don't know if you could ever measure that. And once again, you not deviating from your methods. When you walked in, you after being rejected four times, you had to think maybe they're looking for something else. Why did you never change? Uh, that did cross my mind, and I did talk to people, and people were telling me, you're going to have to change. As an assistant coach, you're close to your players, mm -hmm. you're, you, you care about people, you demonstrate that. As a head coach, you might not be able to do that. And I'm thinking, well, if that's what it takes to be a head coach, I don't know if I want, want to do that. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, mm -hmm. the chaplain for the, the Minnesota Vikings, where I was at the time, just told me, be yourself, be who you are, the Lord has a place for you, and he'll 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 have that 
that spot. You just be the best assistant coach you can be. So I continued, and I, I did go on some interviews, and I, I did talk to one owner who asked me what the makeup of my staff was going to be and what the makeup of my team looked like. And uh, he did say he thought that was maybe too black. And, Use that word. Uh, he didn't say it exactly that way. He, he said something like, well, we, uh, we might not be ready for that or, or something like that. I told him Tyrone Willingham was going to be my offensive mm -hmm. coordinator and here was going to be my coaching staff. And, uh, and I said the first thing I would do is mm -hmm. try to talk Charlie Ward out of his contract mm -hmm. at, uh, with the Knicks, Knicks and come back and really? play quarterback. Mm -hmm. And too much. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if we're ready for that. But that. even more than that, Ian, I really think – what what held me back was my reputation as not being a guy who's going to cuss and you know yeah. and be that type of person because I think a lot the owners had a sense back then that you know they watched Vince Lombardi and George Hallis on yeah. the sideline and that was their view of things so and I did have one owner ask me this in an interview he said I, I did a lot of background on you you don't raise your voice a lot I heard you don't use profanity how are you going to motivate these guys mm -hmm. and so I said well. You know, here's how I've done it as an assistant. Uh, I develop a relationship. We get this bond. I think the guys love me. They want to play for me. They'll, no, that won't work. That won't work. Mm -hmm. So then I get the interview with the Bucks, and Mr. Mm -hmm. Glazer kind of asked me the same thing. And I start thinking, well, should I maybe make something up? Or, yeah. you know, I said, but I got to be who I am. So I told him the same way. And he said, that's just how I raise my boys. That's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a beautiful thing. So I have to ask you, Derek, when you first, you know, met Coach and you, you went through all that, you know, when you questioned him, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, did you ever question his method when we were losing all those games? Because I, I was watching it because I'm a watcher. I sit back and, mm -hmm. I, and I watch, okay? And I, I go, this guy's not going to waver. Like, mm -hmm. this, he's, it's a big deal to be eight seconds late for, for lifting. <laughs> I get that. I get, it's a huge deal. Like, and this mm -hmm. is the thing, I, and I defended Coach Dungey, I don't know how many times. Coach Dungey's not passionate enough. I go, let me tell you something, okay? I've had many coaches in my face yelling, and I looked them back just like this, and Coach never raised his voice, although mm -hmm. I heard the passion in the voice. Yes, we heard the cool But people. if I played poorly... I had a problem looking him in his face, mm -hmm. and I think that's the fatherly part part of it. That's that's what you're trying to get yeah. accomplished, correct? Yeah, it mm -hmm. was. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm gonna let me jump in, Coach. What I what I felt during that time, Ian, was I saw us getting better, and the defensive staff that we had at the time, you know, with Monty, Hearn, Lovey, Rod, their their way of coaching us was showing us our mistakes. So it how it correlated to the result that we were seeing on the field. But what Coach did a good job of, he never allowed us defensively to compare ourselves to you guys on offense. He never allowed for that division. It was, hey, Derek, your alignment speaks to your assignment, and if you're in an A-gap, you're a spill player. Well, when you become a turnback player, this is how that jeopardizes the defense. It's seen on the plate. I see if I do it right. I'm jacked up to do it right in the first quarter. See, this happened in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Why are you not doing this in the fourth quarter? The job hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. Nothing's changed but you. So do it right all the time, and the devil in the details. So we started to see that, and we started seeing the results of that, how that marries to the offense. Now he starts showing us, hey, you guys doing your job defensively. Look how many more possessions our offense get. And I started to see as I understood the game, those all those things started to make sense to me. And the other person in the room, honestly, Hardy Nickerson. Yeah. I saw how, man, this man went about his business every single day as a professional. From note taking, the discipline and lifting, how he practiced. Remember, Coach had to calm him down. Max, he's a, he's only he's, I think he's maybe the only player unless you have somebody in the coach that coach kicked out of practice. Yeah, yeah. Coach had to kick Hardy out of practice oh, a yeah. couple times. I know. When we when other teams came in the scrimmages, yeah. <laughs> Hardy manager aggressive. Well, Hardy had to be shown, but but it's through those examples where I see our head coach has a standard. The leader of our team is not upholding that standard. Mm -hmm. He's not above it. Guess what, Hardy? You kicked out of practice. Yeah. 
man, he just kicked it. I mean, man, Coach Dunn just kicked Hardy out of practice. Mm -hmm. Now, hey, here's why Hardy was kicked out of practice. Coach explained it. Yeah. We got yep. a standard. Yep. It's those things when you talk about unwavering, mm -hmm. those things to me I saw as, as a coach, and I'm blessed now 25 years later to have seen and continue that as he's grown his family to see that as a man. You talk about not getting upset, not getting passionate. There was one time that first year when I almost lost it, mm -hmm. and – you guys will probably remember it. We're getting ready to play the Raiders, and we're on this long losing streak. And Tuesday I get this message on my desk that uh, Reagan Upshaw had missed yes. a, yes. an appointment with yes. the fourth grade, grade class, class, and yes, Eric Rett was 25 minutes yes. late yep. at an autograph session. And yes. I came in yes. on Wednesday morning. Yes. I said, we're not even going to talk about the Raiders. Yeah. Here's a problem we have. And – yeah. I, I didn't quite say it that quietly. <laughs> no, you <but> did not. <laughs> said, you guys got to fix this. And <laughs> it was on the overhead projector. Yep. I, remember, <laughs> I remember a couple other situations, too. I remember the situation where we had the fan day at Raymond. Oh. Uh, Raymond and then some people were behind yeah. the tent. <laughs> Coach Dungy said, you guys can't spend some time with your fans. Right. And, like, once again, that was a fatherly thing yes. to do. Another one, we, went, we were, we were uh, taking a bus to Jacksonville. Everybody was complaining. <laughs> oh, yeah. What are you guys complaining <laughs> about? Because, listen, as a father and all my kids are grown now, I go back to that. <laughs> yeah. What are you complaining <laughs> about? What, do you, what exactly are you complaining about? So <laughs> I love those lessons, and I know Derek has used them yeah. as a parent. I've used them as a parent. Now, let's go back to you. <laughs> getting fired as a Buccaneer coach. Like, I remember you in the office in the rain, and Derek says he was yeah. there. Mm -hmm. He wasn't in the, in the film. I remember yeah. shedding a tear thinking, how can I do my guy like this? Yeah. You know what I mean? When you look back in that, and as an older person who gives advice to a lot of young people, when they tell me something tragic happened, you know what I say to them? Good. You're going to be better. Yeah. yeah. When you look back at that situation, do you think it was warranted, and did that make you better? Uh, it did make me better. Uh, I still, to this day, don't think it was warranted, okay. but I do feel like the ownership, it's their team, mm -hmm. and they have a right to make decisions. I went to the press conference the next day, and I thanked the Glazers for hiring me. They gave me a chance when nobody sure. else did. Mm -hmm. uh, we made the playoffs four times in six years. I thought we were going in the right direction, but they, they disagreed. It's their team. Uh, and we still have a great relationship today. Mm -hmm. If they ask me today, should they have done it, I would say no. Sure. I think mm -hmm. you made a mistake, but I uh, respect your ability to make that decision. Yeah, and my part of it, in is, you know, after all that went down, and I was visibly angry. And as coach, you know, I went up to the facility when I – Figured all the cameras and everybody was gone and Coach was there getting out of his stuff and it was raining. And I went to Coach visibly mad. Like, Coach, I want to be treated. And I told this story a thousand times. I was emotional. I was upset. I didn't want to be a part of this organization because I felt the same way. And Coach being who he is, said, Derek, we stopped packing this stuff. He said, stop. Here's what's going to happen. Yes, you are visible upset, but no, you're not going to. They're not going to trade you. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You're going to get it together. You're going to lead this football team. I remember that conversation. He said, well. This team is on the brink of winning a championship, but more importantly, this team is in a space and place now where it's doing so much for the community. You're such a big part of it. You cannot disappoint yourself or the team. Say what you will do. And this first time he was very stern with me. Sure. You're gonna go and you're gonna lead this football team because a lot of these people, not just on the team, but in this organization, is going to look to see how you are handling mm. this tough situation, how you're gonna respond. I have some opportunities that I'm pursuing, and I'm probably gonna be in the AFC. Okay. <laughs> I knew was yeah. talking about Indy. And we're going to wish you well. But what you're going to do right now is go home, get it together, make sure you pray about it, but make sure you come here tomorrow with a better attitude. I expect more of you. 
And I looked him in his eye to that father figure. I looked Coach in his eye. I said, Coach, I'm sorry. I said, but I'll do exactly what you said. Yeah. And that's exactly what you needed at that time. Oh, it did. Yeah. I, and I was in, in. I was a very young, yeah. upset yeah, you were. <laughs> individual. Yeah. Obviously, wasn't curb, but Coach, I was visibly – I didn't want anything, and when I tell you anything to do mm. with the Bucks, I told, I said, Coach, I hate I even, I mean, I said, I hate I even played, how could they, it was, uh, hey, Coach, let me get all that yeah, out. Get it out. <laughs> get it all out. Get it all out. Get it all out. Yeah. And then and, I said, you yeah. have to lead this team, and you have to support whoever they bring in here, yeah. and you've got to be the guy that yes. helps keep this glue That's going. Beautiful. Now, mm -hmm. We're all humans here, okay? And there's human nature. And I'm gonna let everybody know out there, listening, okay? I played here for seven years, and then I left, I went to Philadelphia. I didn't want to leave, I wanted to stay. So the human nature was, I'm sitting there in Philadelphia now losing, <laughs> and they've been winning. Yeah. And I'm sitting here looking across the pond to the Buccaneers that are now winning. <laughs> I didn't want y'all to win. I'm not gonna lie to nobody. I'm not gonna lie to nobody. I wanted y'all to lose. You didn't want, I, us, to I to you didn't want nope, us to go. Nope. I'm not gonna lie to my man here. Okay, because I go to a bad place. You hated the uniform. I hated. I hated the uniform. I hated. I hated that they were winning. Now I have to ask this question because once again, I'm human and I'm being honest. Okay. How hard was it, or how easy was it? to watch that Super Bowl the next year, and what was your sentiments? I mean, tell me, please, you had 1% saying it. Oh, it was hard. It was very hard. <laughs> I felt like Moses, who got to right to the step of the promised yeah. land, and God said, no, you can't go in. Yeah. Uh, and they went in without him. Uh, I knew they were going to do well, and it was almost like, okay, we did it without you. So it was hurtful. It was hurtful not being there. Sure. But mm -hmm. you know the struggles we had. Mm -hmm and building it from that one and eight and, and being together. And I was so happy for the guys Correct, yeah, that, yeah. hey, they, they saw that this, this was our goal and they saw it through. And I remember uh, going on the radio and someone asked me, how's the game going to turn out? And I said, they're going to kill these guys. There's no way the Raiders can deal with this. It's a passing team. They're going to get smacked. And John Lynch called me and said, Coach, why would you give them all that bulletin board material? I said, John, I'm just telling you the truth. You guys are going to beat these guys by three touchdowns. And they did. And they, did. <laughs> they did. Now, when you look back and somebody says, I, being on sports radio that whole time, everybody was like, that's Tony Dungy's team. That's Tony Dungy's team. And I was saying, all due respect to Tony Dungy, no, it was not. It was not. It was John yeah, Gruden's team. Now, did Tony Dungy develop it and create it? Yes. Okay. What do you think John Gruden brought in that one year? Because, once again, I'm not going to get into John Gruden. I've done it before, and it's not necessary right now. I don't know if he's a guy to develop anything or build anything, but for that one year inserted, he was the best thing that could have been there. What do you think he did that brought – to the team other than just a little bit more offense? Oh, he, he definitely changed the offense mm. and brought some uh, dynamic offensive play. They scored mm. a lot more, and he brought brought a fire to the team, and they, yeah. they played uh, outstanding football, mm. and that was John's team. Mm. Uh, yeah, there's some groundwork there. When I, I won a Super Bowl in Indianapolis, yeah, and sure. Jim Mora mm -hmm. laid mm -hmm. some groundwork there, mm -hmm. you know, and I brought a little bit more to it, and that's the way this thing sure. always goes. So, yeah, that was definitely – John's team, uh, and he did a fantastic job. He did. I mean, you have to give him his credit. Yeah. Now, you mm -hmm. you guys, okay, together, collectively, uh, there's a lot of defenses that have happened in the NFL, lots, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> the Bear defense is mentioned, and the Tampa 2 defense is mentioned. The, the, any, you get any satisfaction from that? I'm watching, like, college, like, <laughs> Ohio is playing the Tampa 2. And I'm thinking, you guys played it so darn well that you're the team that everybody recognizes. Does that ever you have to pinch yourself sometimes? It is quite funny uh, that, that we, we look at this and we have a structure that people have copied and we have things like people – that we need nickel corners now. I never heard that term. Now, Rondy Barber is he created a new position. Uh, no, that that's who we are, and that's how we did it. But having tough-minded guys who play with speed and quickness, I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Parcells took over in Miami as the whatever you call it, president of football <laughs> operations. So he interviewed Leslie Frazier, and he said, "Leslie, I, I'm not even going to hire you." 
I, I don't even want you to, to even think that this, but I have to find out how can you guys win with all those little guys <laughs> out there? In fact, it, it doesn't even make sense to me. You have to explain to me how you did this and so that the whole way we did it yes. kind of took over. And, yes, and it that, did. I'm and, proud of that. Right. And I think our first national attention into the Tampa 2, it was obviously 1999. Yeah. And we played great defense before this. In the, in the cover for a two couple packs of years, for a sure. couple years, yeah. yo. But we got national prominence when we, and I must use the word shut down. We didn't win the game, mm -hmm. but we shut down the so-called greatest show on turf, Facts. playing one coverage, mm -hmm. one, one coverage, oh. mixed in some zone dogs. Mm -hmm. Ninety, I would close to say, close ninety percent. We played cover two. 90%. That's ninety percent of the time. That's all we did. Coach came in that week, and I'll, I'll bring people behind the veil. Mm -hmm. Coach came in that Monday going into that game, and he showed St. Louis. He, he knew certain ways to get to us, too. Sure. He probably showed about 10 or 15 of their explosive plays against teams around the league. Mm -hmm. And he looks out, see us. We're, we're getting pretty, you know, we're a defense that yeah. got a little bit. So we're like, man, why, Coach? Showing us mm -hmm. this. We don't need to see. Mm -hmm. They need to be seeing our defense. Yep. Yep. Mike Morris need to be looking at. So we, so he gets done and he said, yeah, what's the common thread now? They haven't played us. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's well said. It's well said. What's the common thread now? Yeah. They hadn't played us. Here's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. We're going to play cover two. He puts up probably four or five clips of us playing cover two, mm. running to the ball, hitting, mm. tackling, discipline football, ball out, break, mm. pass rush lanes, discipline, five plays. That's how we're going to beat them. Mm. Now, do me a favor. Please don't tell nobody. That's, please don't. I don't think it would have mattered. He was really just talking to one person. No, I understand. So, <laughs> but it was, he was just talking to one person. Oh, oh no. So, I understand. <laughs> please don't tell nobody. Don't say a word this week. Mm. Please. Mm. It went out. And that's all, man. We practiced that, and I think we ran the zone dogs mm -hmm. just to, just to satisfy money. Sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but that was it. That's what we played, yeah. and I think from that defense on, now you started to see teams coming in mm -hmm. and looking at the structure. And I, you know, when Lovey left, he went, he ran. I mean, you saw Herm going to the Jets. You saw other head coaches now mm -hmm. running, and I just felt it started to gain it. But one thing that they never ever could have in running this defense is they never had the, I would say, the original parts. And those were big, huge parts. Coach brought the original architect because he brought it from Steelers in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And they had a different brand of playing it then. But the speed and agility of what we played it, I say, guys, you don't have the parts. You don't have mm -hmm. the athletic Mike running through. That's, that's a physical linebacker mm -hmm. like Hardy Nickerson, but adjusting his sure, game sure, yeah. to play pass. Yeah. To going to the adjustment again, a smaller linebacker, Sheldon Coral, mm -hmm. Jamie Duncan, Nate Webster, smaller linebackers. Yes. You don't have the athleticism of me playing wheel linebacker and Rondé, mm -hmm. undersized as well, but we're stretching the field sideline to sideline. Sure. And we studied and worked our butts off yes, at did. understanding every concept mm -hmm. of this defense. And then up front, yeah. Rob Marinelli, architect and probably the one of the best D tackles, the but. Best. Man, but not just coaching. Yeah. In Rod's secret sauce was not. It, oh, you were telling me nothing. It wasn't coaching. <laughs> no, nah. it was managing yeah. personalities people. people. Yeah, that was Rod. Yeah. Man, that D line you yeah. talk about: Simeon, Ellis, Warren, Gray. Put the practice against his backups. Yes, trust oh, me. Chuck Darby, <laughs> Rod, them, man, yeah. his secret sauce was managing personalities, Correct. man. Mm -hmm. So you had the, the coach, and then obviously you had Monty as as. Monty always found a way to stay on top of the details and challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, at the same time, keep it light, make fun of himself, you know, et cetera. Okay. But we just had that, man. And, and, yeah, I take a little satisfaction in that because that collection of what that defense is named after, man, it's hundreds of players that came through this since 1996 through 2000 to Raheem left in 2012 that ran this defense that was a part of it. So sure. all of them 
And, and all of that is part of it. But the big thing that I think a lot of people forget, I remember John Madden was doing a telecast of our, one of our games. And after the game, I'm listening to the broadcast. And he said, the one thing about this defense is everybody's the same. <laughs> everybody hustles. Everybody tackles. Everybody runs. Everybody flies around. And that's what people couldn't duplicate. That. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you get. I don't care what the X's and O's are, but it's everybody playing hard all the time. And that's, what, that's all we tried to no, sell. Absolutely. I came in and said offensively and defensively, mm -hmm. we're going to play hard, and we're going to go harder, longer than our mm -hmm. opponents. And that's, that's pretty simple. Now, I'm sure you've been asked this question before. When you got here, you had some groceries you know, in, in the pantry, okay? Have you ever thought that the key to this Tampa 2 being the will, you know, the – under tackle and the safety is because of what we had here, or do you think that was that way before? No, that's the key to the defense. And I show, show so you, you how. Into that. I show, no, I'll show you how God works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm a, at the Minnesota Vikings and defensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. John Lynch is coming out of college. Denny Green mm -hmm. coached John yeah. Lynch okay. at Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're in the personnel meeting, getting ready for the draft, and Denny Green is telling our scouts how good John Lynch is and what type of person he is, and our scouts say he's not fast enough. We dropped John Lynch down on mm -hmm. the draft board, and Denny wants him badly. We can't get the scouts to go after he goes to Tampa. Mm -hmm. 1995 draft. Warren Sapp is supposed to be a top three player. Mm -hmm. So all these rumors start, what he might fall, might fall. Denny sends us down to the University of Miami. We do all our background homework. I talk to everybody. We finally get it, and we're going to take one. If he falls to us, we're picking 11. If he falls to us, we're going to take him. Sure. Okay. So, uh, Andrea Kramer from ESPN comes up, and she's, we got two picks in the first round, so what's going to happen, blah, blah. I tell her the whole story. She goes on TV, says they're taking Warren Sapp if he's there. <laughs> The morning of the draft, <laughs> we get a letter from somebody. Denny Green comes in my office and says, we can't take Warren Sapp. <laughs> so now we get to the 11th pick of the draft. Our pick comes up. Andrea like Kramer goes on TV and says, I'm telling you, I talked to Tony yeah. Dungy. They're taking Warren Sapp. <laughs> we take Derek Alexander. <laughs> the Bucks, the next pick, yeah. take Warren Sapp. So now I'm heartbroken because we I got John Randall. I said, if I got John Randall and Warren Sapp together, what kind of defense are we going to have? It wasn't John Randall at first. He wasn't, but he was coming. I knew what he was going to be. He was going to be John Randall. Did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you, know that John, do you know that John Randall was my roommate in Tampa? And I looked at him one day. I go, where are you going? He says, Minnesota's yeah. giving me $5,000 yeah. more. I'm leaving. And I go, all right. Have a great life. Yeah. <laughs> No. I mean, Floyd, he ended up being one of the best ever. <laughs> Floyd Peters, yeah. your defensive line coach, said, yeah, John Randall's okay, but I don't want guys who can't ride on the rides at Bush Gardens. He was my height. He was my height. Yeah. So I'm going to take, take that so one So he goes to Minnesota. Yeah. Right. But I got him, and he's going to be good. And we, after we get sapped, we're going to have something special. So we can't take him. Tampa drafts him. So I'm sitting there in the draft room and said, I, I want to go home. I yeah. said, not only – do I not get warned, but he's going, he's going to play against us for the next 10 years. So now I say, well, I'm going to focus on the other guy I want in this draft, mm -hmm. Derek Brooks. He'd be the perfect will linebacker for us. So we got another pick, mm -hmm. and I'm just getting ready, hoping. Philadelphia trades something mm -hmm. with Tampa. They get up in front of us and take Derek Brooks. I told Denny, I'm, I'm just going home. I said, my two guys. <laughs> so now – we couldn't talk him into taking Lynch. Tampa drafts that. Tampa moves up in front of us, drafts Brooks, and I am mad. I'm sitting in my <laughs> mad. And 11 months later, wow, I'm the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, <laughs> and those three guys are sitting there waiting for me. That is crazy. And, the per and I, I said, yes, I, I called all three of them. Yeah. He called me. And I said, yeah. hey, this defense that we're putting in yes. – is built perfectly for you. You're going to be Jack Ham, mm -hmm. John. You're going to be Donnie Shell, Warren. You're going to be Joe Green. Wow. Now you guys have to do it, but if yes. you do it, there should be multiple championships, multiple Pro Bowls, and Hall of Fame. See, that's amazing. You can mm -hmm. see that in, in advance. And They're perfect for the system. Well, yeah. like, once again, I 
if you came here and they were here, you'd say, well, they're here. Let's build yeah. around them. But it didn't seem to be that well, the case. If you rem- and you'll remember it. When I came down here that mm-hmm. year, Derek was playing left side linebacker. Yes, uh, they were putting a tight end on his <laughs> side the whole <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah. Warren, they were taking out on third down. Yeah. And John was a backup w- right, Will right. Nickel yeah, linebacker well, or something. True, that's true. And, and all they're sitting there and nobody's oh. – and I'm saying, man, these guys are perfect yeah. for what we want to do and they're going to blossom. Well, mm-hmm. Sapp in the first year wasn't Sapp, and Brooks came in as Brooks, you know, and Lynch wasn't Lynch at the beginning yeah. either. Now, but Warren part Sapp's, of that was how they were playing. No, yeah. no, Warren Sapp, Derek Brooks is not hard. He's not hard to deal with. You know what I mean? Like he's the, <laughs> Warren Sapp, a little different. He's a different cat. Now, I was with Bill Parcells for a very brief time mm-hmm. in New York, and I sat and watched the way he dealt with people. And he's a different dude. Okay, you're a different person as well, because. People respect you, but Warren played for you. Like, did you treat oh. – Bill Parcells treated everybody differently. Did you treat Warren differently? No, here's no. what I did. I, when I called Derek in, I called <laughs> everybody, every veteran in. I spoke to you, but I told Warren, I said, hey, here's what we have to do. If we want to win a championship, you've got to be the leader, okay, and you've got to be on my team because mm-hmm. here's what I'm going to tell people. Now, if I'm telling them something and you're telling them something different, we aren't going to win. You might be successful, yeah. but we aren't going to win. Mm-hmm. But if we're on the same page, we're going to win. So Warren, in his way, <laughs> he says, <laughs> I got you, Coach. I'm here to win, mm-hmm. so here's what I need you to do. Just draw the line for me and tell me where you need me to be. And I said, okay, we'll do that. And then, and as only Sap could say it, <laughs> Make sure you draw the line exactly where you want it, because I'm going to be right on the line. (laughs) (laughs) No, he said, no, I'm never going to step over it, so make sure you got it exactly where you want it, because I'm going to be right on it. That's a a different dude, and what makes Warren great also makes him tough to deal with sometimes, you know what I mean? But I'll take take 11 Warren Saps any, any, any day. He wanted to win, and he was one of the smartest players I've ever been around. Uh, Not smarter than this one, though. Uh, it's, they're well, similar. It's, it's similar. Close. It's close. Yeah. Knows is, foot. He knows football. He knows he, it, man. I'm telling you, the smartest individuals yeah. and people don't know because of all the other yeah. stuff Absolutely. that he yeah. keeps in front. He don't yeah. let you get behind. But, yeah, he's one of the smartest individuals mm-hmm. today that I know could talk about any yep. subject. Yep. Yep. And he, he, he is that. Now, again, the exterior, yes. <laughs> and some of it is warranted too. Sure, yeah. and, and we had we shared some stories goes down to a few episodes about, you know, when we're around Warren and sometimes I told Ian when I'm with him, one, he knows in certain settings where, all right, I'm with Brooks, I better dial it back. Oh, oh yeah. And then in certain settings where I know I'm with Sap. <laughs> You'll dial it up. I better dial it up and be more protective, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and try to cut off a lot of the So we we've just obviously just had that unique relationship man since we uh were 16 years old and coach came in and and uh you know the first year we were roommates the only ones with alphabets didn't mm. the last names didn't line okay, up yeah. but in yeah. his world it did yeah. so yeah. <laughs> the second since yeah. second we did that so you, you know he became our roommate and you know all those things just added up over time but one thing never changed man his passion his desire to win mm and see everybody do it the right way, second to none. No doubt. Second to none. Hey, these are standards, man, that, that Coach Dungey said. This is the line that he's drawn. I'm the first one that got the toes on the line, but guess what? Mm-hmm. I'm going to make sure no one's crossing yeah. it. Yeah. Correct, yes. You know, and that's where, again, where people understand, you know, understand that. And, Coach, I want to ask you about this because you mentioned this word, leadership. And it's something that Ian and I – have just been sharing in, in our journeys in our life now. When you look at the word leadership, and I know I'll start by saying this with you, it all starts with your faith in God. But leadership in the world today versus the word leader, how would you address the differences or the similarities between the two when you're talking to a group of people about those two topics. Yeah, leadership is so important in any organization. It's going to tell you how successful you are or, or if you're going to be successful, if you've got the right type of leadership. Uh, I learned about that, again, from Chuck Knoll. Mm-hmm. I had never coached. I get to him, and I said, 
you know, what am I supposed to do? You hired me. I'm 25 years old. What am I supposed to do as a coach? And he told me something I never forgot. He said, you have one job as a coach. That's to help your players be better. Hmm. And I'm waiting for all this, you know, <laughs> philosophical, do this, help your players. And that's what a leader does. A leader helps his group. And the best leaders help their group the most. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I always felt. I was here to help you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't here to be the smartest guy in the room. I wasn't here to be the dictator. I wasn't here to be the, the, anything but what you needed. And if I could help you, if we select the right people and then help them be the best they can be, we're going to win. Mm -hmm. You ever pinch yourself, Coach, and, and – how, like, when you look back, I had you on the air one time when I was on radio, and I asked you a question. I said, you ever just think that you're just a football coach? And I didn't mean that as as a diss. Like, I'm like, you're just a football coach, but you're held in such a high regard. That's got to be a little bit weird. Like, I hear you get invited to the, to the White House and stuff. But <laughs> That's like, weird. That's yeah. weird. Like, it's got to yeah. be a little bit yeah. weird. But how rewarding is it to look back to 96 and you having these visions and then sitting back and watching these guys wearing these yellow ja these Hall of Fame jackets. I mean, that has to be something that blows your it, mind. It is super rewarding, Ian. And to, to talk about that, hey, what we could accomplish and what's important in life. And, yes, to see the Hall of Fame jackets, but to see work done, do 200 homes for single moms. No and to see uh, John Lynch with the scholarship program for the the young academic people here and to see the Brooks Bunch go to Africa um, and to have people who really know say yeah you know you guys won a Super Bowl and that was awesome but but how about that Brooks Bunch you yeah, know right. mm -hmm. how about how about that home for that single mom on, on Armenia um, 25 years later, that's that's powerful. That's awesome. It, it, it has to be. And coach, listen, Derek and I have been doing this podcast by the seventh or eighth one. Your name comes up every single podcast, and uh, your name comes up with me every week. Okay, I, I own a I own a cava and a kratom bar. Okay, and um, I sit down with my people, and I had one young lady was late, and I said, Tony Dungy said to me, I, I bring your name up. Mm -hmm. Tony Dungy said, so-and-so was eight seconds late for lifting, and so-and-so was 85 seconds late for lifting. And I'm like, this dude crazy. <laughs> but then I realized it has to be that important to you. It has to be that important to you. And that has been my mantra. I, I, I was kind of that before, mm -hmm. but that instilled in me the importance of dedication and, and, and passion. And you, you guys are both yeah. passionate people. I know you're a Christian man, and when people say to me, I'm Christian. You know what I asked him? What does that mean to you? That's my question. What does that mean to you? A lot of people don't have answers. I know you guys have the answers because because you live it. And for you guys to be still part of this community, I want to thank both of you guys on behalf of our entire community. You guys hopefully will never go anywhere. And when you guys are gone, and hopefully it's a long time from now, your names ain't going nowhere, okay? And we'll make sure that it doesn't go anywhere. First of all, it's up everywhere anyways. But, Coach, I'm just going to say that I have the utmost respect for you as a man, as a person. Uh, I would have loved to have played for you a little longer. but I, And I didn't ask any Chris Forster questions in respect to you. <laughs> In respect to you, Coach, or else I'd have come at you. I'd have, I'd have come I, at I, you. I, I appreciate <laughs> that. Well, Coach, before we uh, wrap up, I, I do want to ask this. Pro Football Hall of Fame, you being selected to that group and a part of that team, tell us, one, if you can, how you was informed, and secondly, what it means to you, and thirdly, Share because I see your Steelers, and I said this to all the Steelers. They kind of got their own area, oh, yeah, they do. you know, that they hang out with yeah, in right? Canton, and, you know, <laughs> everyone knows. Mm -hmm. But Pro Football Hall of Fame, you know, what, again, that means to you? Um, special honor. I mean, you grow up and you dream about making the National Football League, maybe dream about scoring a touchdown in the Super Bowl, those kind of things. I never dreamed about being in the Hall of Fame. It's not something you even think about. Um, to go in as a coach when there hadn't been African-American coaches um, and to know that there could have been some, but maybe they didn't get the opportunity and that I was representing them, it was pretty special. Uh, Ira Kaufman presented, did my presentation and he was magnificent. 
you go in and there's you know 25 people and they're going to select five and you just never know you, you, what's going to happen they tell you to go back to your hotel room and <laughs> if you get a phone call they'll mm -hmm. they'll that means hey sorry you didn't make it this time if you get a knock on the door mm -hmm. uh they're coming to congratulate you and waiting and waiting and waiting and hours go by and nothing's happening and then the knock on the door mm -hmm. It was uh, one of those moments that you never forget. I mean, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine it, and uh, you guys were both very deserving. And once again, Coach, thank you from the whole community. Um, like I said, your name's going down in, in the history. Both of you, both of you both should be very proud of what you accomplished. And uh, it's not going anywhere, okay? You guys are still touching lives in our community, and it'll mm -hmm. continue to happen. It's never going to stop because, you know, you know, Tony Dungy and Derek Brooks are one of the pioneers of getting like a lot of these charities going, and after that, it just became second nature. And I think that's that's a beautiful thing. Coach, thank you thank for you, everything Ian. you've Great done. To be with Absolutely, you again. You're a beautiful man. Always, Coach. And uh, always appreciative. It's it's good to yes. do a podcast with two beautiful men. I'm okay to say these men are beautiful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Leroy Samuel was a beautiful man yes, as well. Okay, and I'm putting him in the same category. Yes, absolutely. But this has been a pleasure, and uh, this has been uh, Brooks and Beckles and uh, Coach Dungy. If he wants to ever come and just hang out, we're gonna let him do it. Yes. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be good for ratings. So. Uh, <laughs> Tune in next week. It's been Brooks and Beckles. Peace out, everybody. <laughs>